you go right back, the idea that you would go to the seaside was really foreign. People had an enormous fear of the sea right up until the middle of the 19th century. Huge numbers of people were losing their lives in shipwrecks every year. So that the sea was something you avoided if at all possible. What happened in the late 18th century was this just extraordinary sort of turnaround. The concept of the seaside holiday came about initially through the aristocracy. It was regarded to be the de rigueur thing, the a la mode thing to go and take the waters. It was thought to be something that would actually improve your health if you did so. And we saw lots of aristocracy and landed gentry heading off to the coasts, mainly around the south of England. The role of the monarchy was crucial because if you go along that Sussex coast, it was full of different members of that rather large royal family at that point, uh, many of whom led quite dissolute lives. So they were drinking lots and they had their mistresses uh, established in these seaside resorts. It became incredibly fashionable. This took very small communities that were apparently, you know, to start with, mainly just very small fishing villages, tiny communities. Um, all of a sudden you had the landed gentry arriving on your doorstep. They had to have somewhere to stay. Some of the local inns wouldn't have been the places that they would have thought to frequent. So it became the start of that part in time where actually you had hotels springing up um, throughout the sort of um, late 18th century, early 19th century. Hotels started springing up. People started to build themselves homes down by the sea. As the Industrial Revolution took off, people were looking for areas that were not industrialised and they wanted to encounter nature. And so this sort of idealisation and romanticisation of nature uh, emerged. And they also needed clean air. I mean, there's a very you know, direct correlation between the smog of urban cities and the desire for clean, fresh air that was available at the seaside. So this kind of therapeutic uh, aspect of the seaside, the idea that it was good for you, is actually uh, completely true. You could breathe. There was a real industry in places like Margate and Brighton and Scarborough around encouraging people to take the waters for every possible kind of illness. Uh, and out of that grew this idea that actually if you're going to take the waters, you might as well have fun at the same time. Uh, and so, you know, you've got the beginnings of a resort where there's lovely restaurants and music and theatre and, um, and the idea of, of fun. I mean, the seaside resort is all bound up with the history of fun. The concept of a holiday didn't exist for the general public, for the working class. Of course it didn't. It wasn't until the 1938 Holiday Pay Act that actually it was enshrined in law that you were due paid leave. And so for many people, there just wasn't the opportunity before then to actually take time off and enjoy themselves. The arrival of holidays as part of your job really opened up that market. People started to go to the coasts en masse. The rise of the railways and the building of the railways again was another instrumental part in that. But if you talk about the real heyday of this British seaside towns, we're talking about the 50s and 60s, that post-war era where whole factories would close down jump onto coaches and head to the seaside for a break. Um, and that was also the era, of course, of Billy Bucklin and of the holiday camps. And all of a sudden, it was something that the working man could afford to take off with his family and have a break by the seaside. The big boom, of course, has got to be Blackpool. What they were able to do in Blackpool was draw in all sorts of people from the Lancashire mill towns, West Yorkshire, Glasgow, you know, a whole industrial swathe of Britain. And the train lines were key. The train lines were always key. Providing your resort had a good, fast link to major urban centres, they were arriving in their thousands. Lots of people moved in to service the hotels. It became a source of, you know, big employment and you got a lot of people moving in. So the population of these seaside towns increased rapidly. And of course, it wasn't just about going and having a dip in the sea. This was going to be somewhere where people were going to kick back and relax. And that led to huge amounts of entertainment facilities being brought into place. Well, there were lots of jobs. There were lots of opportunities. If you were enterprising, you could make money. Um, th these were, you know, good times. But there was always a precariousness. One of the things that's really interesting is that Blackpool, in, before the First World War, in the winter, they needed food banks to, you know, huge numbers turned up at the food banks in Blackpool, the equivalent of the food bank, you know, soup runs, etc. So there's always been a sort of precariousness to the economy of these towns, that poverty was, was a familiar thing. 
The decline really began sort of uh, in, the, in the late 70s. What happened to our seaside towns and what led to its decline, unfortunately, was the overseas package tourism boom. The British fell in love with the town. <laughs> The founding father of the overseas package holiday was Vladimir Reitz, who founded Horizon Holidays and on his first ever package holiday took 300 holidaymakers in the summer of 1950 on a plane from London to Corsica, where they stayed in effectively what was a camp, a holiday camp with ex-army surplus tents to sleep in, but there was a very different, big, important difference to the kind of holidays these people would have had at home and the holidays they had here at that time. The era of rationing was still amongst us, and for this idea that people could go to Corsica and for one price, 32 pounds and 10 shillings, they would get bed and board and as much free-flowing wine and meat-filled meals as they could eat. And that was a hugely big draw. Horizon Holidays was formed and that was the birth of the overseas package holiday. They filled up the beaches in Spain and they wanted to go to Greece and then they wanted to go to Turkey. All of a sudden, heading abroad for your holiday wasn't just something that the, the well-off and the privileged could do, this was something that the common man could do. It seems it really is boom time in the package holiday business. There was very much a transformation in the same way that you saw in Blackpool in the likes of Benidorm in Spain. So Benidorm in Spain were very clever, it was a tiny fishing village and they just decided, listen, if we're going to make money out of these stories, we're going to have to do it in the right way. They decided they were going to have high-rise towers built and they would house the tourists in very high-rise hotels but make sure they were all in big grounds and they all had fabulous views then of that incredible bay and the Mediterranean Sea. They very much decided that the English tourist was worth entertaining because of the sheer amount of money that it brought into their economy. More and more people were thinking, well, actually, I'll go to, to Spain and be sure of the sun. I, you know, the Costa del Sol really began to take off in the 70s and by the 80s that was really beginning to impact on seaside towns. Less were returning back to their traditional coastal villages and coastal towns to have that traditional holiday. The paradox is that actually people still visit all our seaside resorts in huge numbers. The problem is they're not staying and they're not spending enough money when they're there. I describe it as a de-industrialization of these towns because most of these towns were, were kind of built to cater for thousands and thousands of visitors. The scale of the visitor attractions in places like Blackpool is huge uh, and that industry has really declined. So that is a, is a really significant challenge in itself. But I think what has made it a thousand times more difficult is a phenomenon that I call the trap and the refuge. Trap because if your house is losing value, your chances of the job are not great, you get stuck. So that's the trap problem. You get stuck and you can't move out. What, what co combines with that is what I call the refuge problem, which is when people hit hard times in major urban cities, Manchester, London, Bristol, they think, well, I can't afford the rents anymore, property's too expensive, I'll get on the train because I remember having a lovely holiday beside the sea and I'll try and start again, I'll try and make my life work. Sometimes they're arriving with substance abuse problems, they're fleeing domestic violence or they've just come out of prison. What we have moving to the seaside are people with really vulnerable, fragile lives, mental health issues, for example. And it's, it's, it's immensely difficult for the local authority services to provide the support to help these people make that second chance a reality. The fact that there is people having a hard time is unavoidable. And that's really problematic for a place that is a holiday resort. You know, if you're going there to have a nice day out and you keep bumping into people who are clearly in a really bad way, you can see why people then come away saying, you know, it, 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 this, that, that place is horrible and it really depressed me and I don't want to go back. 
I don't think we're ever going to get back to the, you know, the heydays of the 1950s. People are just not travelling in the same way, but there is still a lot that can be done with these seaside towns. We've still got, as we saw in the pandemic, a real demand to actually explore our own coastlines, but it needs investment and it needs some really sort of quite quirky thinking to actually attract people not only to what we have now, but to look at what we can do with these beautiful cities going forward into the future. A lot of these places are actually really beautiful places to live and there's no reason now, given the revolution we've been through around working from home, why these cities can't reimagine a new future for themselves. It might not be a future about being a great tourist destination, it might be something different and actually that might not be a bad idea, they might be able to diversify. There have been some really big success stories and that is Brighton and Hove is a great success story. Uh, Bournemouth is a great success story and it's interesting Margate has still got some challenges but it's changed a huge amount. I've just been to Folkestone. It's absolutely beautiful place and it's an hour from London. Now because London is so expensive more and more people will think well you know why don't I just live in Folkestone and I get to be on the beach and I can kayak in the morning and do a little bit of work in the afternoon. You know, it's kind of, I think that it's possible to imagine if the train connections are good and are in place and there's good digital connectivity and if the schools begin to improve, then I think we'll see lots of young people deciding I'd rather raise a family where I can take the kids on the beach than stuck in a tiny flat in the middle of Manchester or London.